Brothers and sisters, we are continuing our series in the Gospel of Mark. And this week we are looking at chapter 7 of the Gospel of Mark. And in this chapter, Jesus once again seemingly turns on its head an idea that the uh, particularly the Jewish leaders, the, the religious leaders, seemed to have. And so this particular chapter, as we're looking at the big picture of Mark chapter 7, we are looking at specifically the reality that it is not what goes into you that defiles you, but what comes out of you that defiles you. And, uh, and we'll talk about that more as we go along. Uh, but first, let us read through the chapter, chapter 7. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So, the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is korban, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. 
Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought him a man, brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took, that, took him aside away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh and to, said to him, Ephatha, that's a hard word to say, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. The word of the Lord. Amen. So there are a few details that need to be explained in this, uh, just like uh, with most of the chapters uh, that we are looking at. Uh, the first thing that we need to be clear about is Jesus is not against hand hygiene or cleanliness, right? Jesus is not opposed to washing your hands. Don't take this passage and go away and say, well, uh, I don't care what the health unit says. I'm not going to wash my hands anymore. Uh, that would be the wrong lesson to take from this. The, the washing of hands that, that, that we're talking about here is a ceremonial washing. And it, it actually probably didn't do a lot to actually clean the hands. What they would do is that they would come into a house or whatever where they were going to eat and they would have a bowl near the door and the, the, the Pharisees, the Jewish people, whatever, they would dip their hands in it and pray a prayer and, and sort of be dramatic about it. But there's not a lot of scrubbing and there's no soap and there's certainly not any antibacterial hand wash or anything. It was a gesture. It was a traditional gesture of cleansing, right? And so, you know, Jesus is not opposed to hand washing per se. The problem, of course, is that the, the Pharisees and the other Jewish leaders and teachers were going through the motions of this cleansing while really their hearts were conniving and wicked and twisting the law of God to their own advantage. And that's where we get, of course, Jesus saying that they honor, they honor God with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And they worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. And then Jesus goes on to explain a particular example. And this is important. The Jewish people understood that when Moses taught that they were to honor their father and mother, that meant a lot of things. Along with the things, the many things that, that were included in honoring your father and mother was that you were to take care of your father and mother when they became no longer able to care for themselves in their old age, right? Uh, and this is something that we have emphasized to our children often, that they are to take care of us when we are old and infirm, which is coming along pretty quickly. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling it right now. Uh, so, uh, right, they understood that this is what, but the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders, they twisted things. There was this idea that you could set aside, if you made a holy vow, a portion of your resources and dedicate it to God. That's what we hear about in verse 11. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is korban, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. 
right? So it was a loophole, according to the Pharisees. Oh, uh, I don't really want to provide for my mom and dad, so I'm going to say that this money that I have, these resources that I have, they're dedicated to God, right? And then, of course, they would go ahead and use them for their own purposes and for their own well-being and stuff because they and everything they do is dedicated to God, but meanwhile, they are leaving their parents out in the lurch, right? Okay? So this is the wicked twisting of the law of God that they use, right? And, and obviously you can see the tremendous hypocrisy when, when the Jewish leaders are calling out Jesus and his disciples for not washing their hands ceremonially when meanwhile they go weaseling around the law of Moses to do these terrible things to the parents whom they are supposed to honor. But then you get to a very interesting thing because Jesus says then following that in verse 14, listen to me everyone and understand this, nothing outside a person can defile them but by going into them, rather it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. And this is really, really important and really topsy-turvy for the people of Israel because the reality, if anybody read uh, Leviticus or Numbers or Deuteronomy anytime recently? Yeah? Okay. So in Leviticus especially, there are a lot of rules about what's clean and what's not clean, right? Yeah, a lot, a lot. Uh, do we abide by all these rules? No, no, we don't. Uh, there's, there's things about like if a bug crawls into a pot and dies in there, then that pot is defiled and all kinds of stuff. There's lots and lots of stuff in there about cleanliness. And, and those are laws that came from God. So what is God saying here? Jesus is speaking as the Son of God, as one with God. God the Father, is, is Jesus contradicting what God the Father said to the people of Israel? No, not at all. Jesus is not. Rather, Jesus is clarifying what the purpose of those laws is, was, were, I don't know what tense to use there. What the purpose of the Levitical laws were versus the reality of the heart of the law once again. Right? The reality of many of those Levitical laws is that they were there primarily to help remind the people of Israel over and over and over again that they were to be set aside, that they were to be special. They were God's covenant children. They were in a distinct and special relationship with God. And so every time a bug crawled in a pot or whatever happened, they were to be remembering that their relationship with God is unique and special. And so what it was supposed to do, among other things, was remind the people of Israel to take seriously each and every day their relationship with God. They were to live clean lives because God had set them apart. But the heart of those Levitical laws was never about how they could actually become dirty and filthy and defiled by those things. Looking at it that way would miss the point. And that's what Jesus is saying, right? You have looked at the Levitical laws and you have made all kinds of traditions and you have missed the point. Because those things were supposed to remind you to live outwardly 
and live lives that are clean, shining the light of God from your hearts in all you say and do, but instead you go through the motions and pretend that you're clean unless something bad comes in. And you may think that this is a little bit irrelevant to us because we don't abide by those Levitical laws particularly. There are a lot of ceremonial cleanliness, defilement-y sort of things that Paul made clear don't really particularly apply to us. However, we still have this hanging around in our society that somehow things that are outside of us can defile us when they come in right you see that in the debate that paul has with people about food sacrifice to idols right he says look the reality is that food sacrifice to idols cannot in itself make you unclean but if your conscience struggles with it, then don't eat the food to sacrifice to idols. Right? We can see that in the way... Hmm, we see that in the way that, for example, sometimes still, in our culture and in many other cultures, a girl who becomes pregnant or who is, and I'm sorry to use this word, but a girl who is raped, sometimes the blame in some way falls on her. As if, you know, she was asking for it or she, um, she is now defiled. You, you hear it sometimes, too, in, in other cultures where no one will want to marry this girl because she's no longer a virgin or, or something like that. As if something that was done to her has somehow ruined her. And I'm sorry to speak about something so uncomfortable, but it's baloney. Right? Something that is done to you, something that comes into you from outside, is not what defiles you. You see this also in abusive relationships, too, where people take in what is done to them and say, I deserved it, it was me, it's my fault, I'm a terrible person, if I was just a better person, then, then he wouldn't be forced to hit me, or what have you. And that's not the way it works. It's not the way it works. What does matter is what comes from your heart out into the world. What comes from your heart out into the world. And this is, this is what Jesus says when he says, Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. Now he's speaking particularly about food there, but the principle is the same with other things as well. He went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. This is how we know that he's speaking about more than things, uh, more than just food, right? For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. And we could probably add to this list, right? Racism, for example, comes from inside your heart and comes out. It defiles you. 
right? Hate, abuse comes from inside your heart and comes out. And it's not just the big things either. It's also the small things. Think about this. What do you, what do I, what do we post on social media if you do social media? What do we put on there? Do we put things that are full of evil? Do we put things that are hateful? Do we put things that, that show other people to be terrible? They're slanderous, defamatory do we sow distrust with what we say in our social media? Or what do we say casually when we're not at church to people? Do we say unkind things about, excuse me, about other people in our church? Oh, well, so-and-so. They're always exaggerating things or, or whatever. Are we saying things that we wouldn't say to them, that we don't say to them? What is the overflow of our hearts? And then you move on to this story about the Syrophoenician woman and her faith. And this is, a, I love this story because this indicates that Jesus does indeed have a sense of humor. Which, of course, is something that is kind of obvious, seeing as he created humor uh, in the very beginning. But it is good to see. This Syrophoenician woman comes to Jesus and says, Hey, look, I've got a, a, a daughter who has a demon in her. Please, please heal her. Drive out the demon. And Jesus says... First, let the children eat all they want, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. And of course, he is using a, a metaphor there. He is saying that the children are the people of Israel, uh, the Israelites, the Jewish people, and that the dogs are the, uh, the Gentiles, the Greeks, and, and so on and so forth. But be careful, because remember what Jesus, how Jesus interacts with Gentiles throughout his ministry, how Jesus interacts with the woman at the well, how Jesus interacts with the, the centurion and uh, his family, how Jesus interacts with various, uh, with the demon-possessed man, Legion, uh, the man who was possessed by Legion, right? Uh, Jesus does not treat them in any way like dogs. There must have been something in this interaction where Jesus knew that this woman was sharp as a tack and she was going to get this and it would be interesting and fun to see how she reacts, right? So he says, first let the children eat all they want for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. And then she just just as Jesus anticipated, she takes it up with a sharp wit and says, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. She doesn't get in all huffy, offensive argument about how she's not a dog, right? She's, she plays with it. She rolls with the punches and she responds to Jesus cleverly and clearly. And so Jesus sees in her heart something coming out that he recognizes as fun and beautiful and wise and witty. And he, it doesn't say he laughs, but I bet you he at least chuckled. He says, for such a reply you may go. The demon has left your daughter. Right? What comes out of her heart is a humble but yet firm desire to get her daughter healed. And a perseverance and an insistence that she needs the help. And it comes out of her this wit and this intelligence and this humor. And so this package, God sees, Jesus sees something beautiful and she has her daughter healed. And then likewise, we move on to Jesus healing a deaf and mute man. And again, there are some people who bring to Jesus a deaf 
and mute man. And remember that in Jesus' day, all the people who were crippled or disabled, it was a sign to the people of Israel that these people were not favored by God. Somehow they or their parents or something somewhere along the line, somebody did something that displeased God. Therefore, they are punished with the consequences, which in this case are that this person is deaf and mostly mute. Right? But yet these friends, they love this man Enough to bring him to Jesus and ask for healing. They don't care that he's defiled. They don't care that according to the Jewish tradition and law, this man is unclean. They bring him anyway. And Jesus, seeing the love there and seeing what is coming out of the hearts of these friends, Jesus heals the man. And then most of all in this, when Jesus says that what goes into you is not what defiles you, but what comes out of you, Jesus is the example of what comes out that is good good, right? We see a couple of examples of what comes out of people being good in, in the, the deaf person's friends and in the Syrophoenician woman, but the ultimate example of what comes out of the heart being a good thing is Jesus himself. People, verse, seven, verse 37, example, excuse me. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. He has done everything well. What does Jesus do well? He heals the sick. Yeah. But he also spends time with the sick. He doesn't run away from those who are defiled and unclean according to society. He spends time with those who are sinners and tax collectors. He spends time with the people who are rejected by society as being unclean. He heals them and loves them. He treats people with respect, even Gentiles, even Samaritans. He loves people in Jesus' name. In God's name, excuse me. Right? He does everything well. He doesn't go around hoisting conspiracy theories about the government in front of everybody and defaming their name. He doesn't go around saying bad things about certain immigrant groups. He doesn't go around saying terrible things about, about how, you know, terrible people are taking away their jobs or anything like that. He speaks love. And he speaks truth. And he goes away from the human traditions and into the heart of God's law. And he praises Mary when she exorbitantly pours out perfume on his feet and washes his feet. So, brothers and sisters, what comes out of you? What comes out of me? Sometimes what comes out of me is not great. I don't think... 
I say too many terrible things about other people. But I know I'm not perfect. And I know sometimes what comes out of me in terms of my actions is inadequate. It's not good enough. It's not loving enough. It's not self-sacrificing. In fact, it's downright selfish. And so what comes out of me is selfishness instead of selflessness. What about you? Brothers and sisters, because of Jesus, we can learn to live increasingly more and more each day as people who have good things coming out of our hearts instead of defilement. This is what Jesus was not only acting out, but also what he was teaching his disciples each and every day. So, brothers and sisters, let us live with good coming out of our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit and by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we know that apart from you, no one not even ourselves could say that we have done everything well. <clears throat> we know that apart from you, we would indeed do everything poorly. And not just as in low quality, but poorly as in, in a defiled manner. But we also know, O oh God, that you came in Jesus Christ so that we may see what it looks like to live and do everything well. We also see that in you, O oh God, in Jesus your Son, you have provided the means by which we can be forgiven of all our sin. We can be cleansed of all that defiles us. All that comes from our hearts apart from you. And we see also, O oh God, in the gift of your Holy Spirit, the opportunity for our hearts themselves to be changed from hearts of stone to hearts of flesh. Where what comes out of us can be in reality as good as what you credit us with through Jesus' grace. Father, help us. Help us to more and more not have the bad come out of us but instead have the good come out of us. Not, not because we simply hide and suppress the evil, but rather because, O oh God, you through your Spirit continue to cleanse us. May we practice and discipline ourselves to say and do that good. And may we do so through the power of your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll invite the praise team forward for our song of response. Our song of response is appropriately enough refiner's fire, uh, and we will be praying as we sing that or as we go through that in our hearts and minds that God would refine us so that we may be as gold, pure gold. Let us stand together. <clears throat>